Aloha, this is Edwin. And are we broadcasting well? Why can we not see anything? Hmm. There we go. Now we're broadcasting. That is fantastic. All right. So this is going to be part two of story time with Redwall. Now Redwall is this fantastic series of books by Brian Jakes. Most of this is appropriate for children. Uh, very young children might be a little bit put off with some of the violence in there. There is, there is some violence in there. <laughs> this is not a monetized stream. I do not own any of the rights to this. Um, I did put, if you would like to support this series, I did put uh, a link to Amazon. It's not an affiliate link. I don't make a dime off of it. I just wanted to do something fun and appropriate for families during... Uh, during, I know a lot of people are, are having to stay at home now, so I wanted to do something fun and relatively wholesome. And let me double check and make sure that the stream is running okay. And, and is everybody able to hear okay? Where is, where is my chat? Let's see. And let me know if the audio is okay, if there's any problems with the audio, and I'll, I'll make adjustments, and let me know if there's too much background noise. All right. <laughs> All right, so we read, in the first part of this, we read chapters 1 through 5, so we're going to be picking up in chapter 6, if you are reading along at home. We'll give it, I am a little bit early, so we'll give it a couple more minutes to spool up. I'll make sure I'm set up, and hopefully all of you are doing absolutely great. So uh, I and and my family are here in Hawaii, and so far, so far we've been spared from a lot of sickness. We do we do have some cases of the coronavirus here, but we don't have any deaths, and we've had very minimal number of hospitalizations. Hawaii is very dependent on tourism, though. And so some of our some of our friends and neighbors, you know, they're wondering how they're going to get by. I, I'm sure that's the story in just about all of the United States right now. If people are wondering how they are going to get by. Hopefully there'll be some good news when the legislation is passed today, and hopefully that'll create some relief for people. But make sure to make sure to look out for your friends, your family, and your neighbors, particularly if you have some elderly neighbors. Right now maybe is not the best time for elderly people or people in poor health to be going to the grocery store, running errands and stuff. So if you can help some of your neighbors, please do that. All right, once again, we're going to be starting with Redwall. Uh, in the first part of this, we read chapters 1 through 5. We're going to pick up on chapter 6. I'm going to back up just a little bit, just a little bit into chapter 5 to get warmed up some. Okay? Now, in, if you're following along with this at the Redwall Abbey, and all these characters are mice and little woodland creatures, they've just had this big feast and the main protagonist, the main protagonist, Matthias, uh, and the badger are now kind of driving people home. And they were, they were on their way to drop off this one particular family. And let's pick it up. I'm just backing up about a page into chapter 5. The old cart rolled on gently down the long, dusty road. They were now over halfway to the ruined church of St. Ninian, where John Churchmouth lived, as had his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him. Matthias had fallen into a deep slumber. Even Constance, Constance is the badger pulling this cart, even Constance was unable to stop her eyelids drooping. She went slower and slower. It was as if the little cart and its occupants were caught in the magic spell 
of an enchanted summer night. Suddenly, and without warning, they were roused by the thunder of hooves. Nobody could determine which direction the sound was coming from. It seemed to feel the very air about them as it gathered momentum. The ground began trembling with the rumbling noise. Some sixth sense warned Constance to get off the road to a hiding place. The powerful badger gave a mighty heave. Her blunt claws churned the roadside soil as she propelled the cart through a gap in the hawthorn hedge down to the slope of the ditch where she dug her paws in, holding the cart still and secure while John Churchmouse and Cornfowler's father jumped out and wedged the wheels firmly with stones. Matthias gasped with shock as a giant horse galloped past, its mane streaming out, eyes rolling in panic. It was towing a hay cart, which bounced wildly from side to side. Matthias could see rats among the hay. But these were no ordinary rats. They were huge, ragged rodents, bigger than any he had ever seen. Their heavy, tattooed arms waved a variety of weapons, pikes, knives, spears, and long, rusty cutlasses. Standing boldly on the, black, on the backboard of the, hay cat, of the hay cart was the fiercest. <laughs> Standing boldly on the backboard of the hay cart was the biggest, fiercest, most evil-looking rat that ever slunk out of a nightmare. In one claw, he grasped a long pole with a ferret's head spiked to it while in the other was his thick, enormous tail, which he crapped like a whip, Whoosh! laughing madly, <laughs> and yelling strange curses. He swayed to and fro skillfully as horse and wagon clattered off down into the night. As suddenly as they had come, they were gone. Yeah, Victor, I, and I'm talking to someone in the chat. I, I said I would back up just about a page right before we get into Chapter 6. Just get warmed up a little bit from where we left off. Matthias walked out into the road, staff in hand. Stray wisp of hay drifted down behind him. His legs trembled uncontrollably. Constance hauled the abbey cart back onto the road. Cornflower was helping her mother and Mrs. Churchmouse to calm the little one's tears of fright. Together they stood in the cart tracks amid the settling dust. Did you see that? I saw it, but I don't believe it. What in heaven was it? What in hell more like? All those rats, such big ones too. I. And that one on the back, he looked like the devil himself. Seeing Matthias still stunned by what had happened, Constance took over the leadership. She wheeled the cart around. I think it's best we head back for the abbey, she said firmly. Father Abbott will want to know about this straight away. Knowing that the badger was far more experienced than himself, Matthias assumed the role of second-in-command. Right, Cornflower. Get in the cart and take charge of the mothers and babies, he said. Mr. Fieldmouse, Mr. Churchmouse, up front with Constance, please. Silently, the mice did as ordered. The cart moved off with Matthias positioned on the back providing a rear guard. The young mouse gripped his staff tightly, his back to his charges, facing down the down the road in the direction the hay cart had taken. Now that's the end of chapter 5, so let's go right into chapter 6. Chapter 6. The horse had gotten away safely. It was the hay cart 
that suffered most damage. Bolting recklessly from side to side down the road, the blinkered animal failed to see the twin stone gate post on its right. Skidding crazily, the cart smashed into the uprights. There was a loud splintering of shafts. As the horse careened onwards, trailing in its wake reins, tracers, and shattered timber. His lightning reflexes serving him well, Clooney leaped clear. He landed cat-like on all fours as the hay cart upended in the roadside ditch, its buckled wheels spinning awkwardly. Feeling braced after his mad ride with the subsequent narrow escape, Clooney strode to the ditch's edge. The distressed cries of those trapped beneath the cart reached his ears. He spat contemptuously, narrowing his one good eye. Come on, get up out of there, you cringing load of cat's meat, he bellowed. Red Tooth, Dark Claw, report to me or I'll have your skulls for Skittles. <laughs> skulls for Skittles. <laughs> Clooney's two hintrants pulled themselves from the ditch, shaking their heads dazedly. Crack! Slash! The whip like tail brought them swiftly to his side. Three leg and scratch are dead, chief. Dead as dirt. The cart crushed him, chief. Stupid fools, snarled Clooney. Serves them right. What about the rest? Old Wormtail, old Wormtail has lost a paw. Some of the others are really hurt. Clooney sneered. Ah, They'll get over it and suffer worse by the time I'm done with them. They're getting too fat and sluggish by the tripes. They'd not last five minutes in a storm at sea. Come on, you dead and alive rag bags. Get up here and gather round. <laughs> Rat struggled from the ditch and the cart frantic to obey the harsh command as quickly as possible. They crowded about the undamaged gatepost, which their leader had chosen as a perch. None dared to cry or complain about their hurts. Who could predict what mood the warlord was in? <laughs> right. Cock your lugs up and listen to me, Clooney snarled. First, we gotta find out where we've ducked. Let's take a bearing on this place. Red Tooth held up his claw. The Church of St. Ninian, Chief. It says so on the notice board over yonder. Well, no matter, Clooney snapped. I'll do as a berth until we find something better. Fangburn, cheese thief. Here, Chief. Scout the area. See if you can find a better lodging for us than this heap of rubble. Trail back to the west. I think we passed a big place on the way. Aye, aye Chief! Frog blood! Scum nose! Chief! <laughs> Frog blood and scum nose. <laughs> I love these names. Chief! Take 50 soldiers to see if you can round up any rats that know the lie of the land. Get big, strong rats. But bring along some weasels, stoats, and ferrets, too. They'll do in a pinch. Mine now. Don't stand for any arguments. Smash their dens up so they won't have any homes to worry about. If any refuse to join up, then kill them there and then. Understood? All clear, Chief! <laughs> Clooney's bloodthirsty. Rag ear! Mange fur! Take 20 rats and forage for supplies. The rest of you get inside the church. Red tooth. Dark claw. Check the armor. 
See if there are things about that we can use as weapons. Iron spike railings. There's usually enough of them around a churchyard. Jump to it. Clooney had arrived. Why? <laughs> Chapter 7. Matthias had never stayed up all night in his life. He was just a bit tired, but strangely excited. Great events seemed to have been sent in motion by his news. Immediately upon being informed of the Haycourt incident, the abbot had insisted upon calling a special council meeting of all Redwall's creatures. Once again, Cavern Hole, and Cavern Hole is this gathering area inside the Red Wall Abbey, okay? Once again, Cavern Hole was packed to the doors, but this time it was for a purpose very different from the feast. Constance and Matthias stood in front of the Council of Elders. All about them was a hum of whispers and muttering. Abbot Mortimer called order ding, 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 by ringing a small bell. Pay attention, everyone. Constance and Matthias, would you please tell the council what you saw tonight on the road to St. Ninian's? As clearly as they could, the badger and the young mouse related the incident of the rat-infested haycart. The council began questioning them. Rats, you say? Matthias, what type of rat? inquired Sister Clements. Big ones, Matthias replied, though I'm afraid I couldn't say what kind they were or where they had come from. What about you, Constance? Well, I remember that my old granddad once knew a sea rat, she answered. Going by his description, I'd say that's what they looked like to me. And how many would you say there were of these rats? Father Abbot asked. Couldn't say for sure, Father Abbot. There must have been hundreds. Matthias? Oh, yes, Father. I'd agree with Constance. At least 400. Did you notice anything else about them, Constance? Indeed, I did, Father Abbot. My badger senses told me right off these were very bad and evil rats. The badger's statement caused uproar and shouts of, Nonsense! Pure speculation! That's right! Give a rat a bad name! <laughs> Without even thinking, Matthias raised a paw and shouted aloud, Constance is right. I could feel it for myself. There was one huge rat with a ferret skull on a pole. I got a good look at him. It was like seeing some horrible monster. In the silence that followed, the abbot rose and confronted Matthias. Stooping slightly, he stared into the young mouse's bright eyes. Think carefully, my son. Was there anything special you noticed about this rat? Matthias thought for a moment. Everyone was watching him. He was much bigger than the others, father. What else? Think, Matthias. I remember. He only had one eye. Right? or left? Left, I think. Yes, it was the left, Father. Now, can you recall anything about his tail? I certainly can, Matthias squeaked. It must have been the longest tail of any rat alive. He held it in his claw as if it were a whip. The abbot paced up and down, 
before turning to the assembly. Twice in my lifetime, I have heard travelers speak of this rat. He bears a name that a fox would be afraid to whisper in the darkness of midnight. Clooney, the scourge. A deathly hush fell upon the creatures in Cavern Hole. Clooney the Scourge! Surely not! He was only some kind of folk legend, a warning used by mothers when youngsters were fractious or disobedient. Go to sleep, or Clooney will get you. Eat up your dinner, or Clooney will come. Come in this instant, or I'll tell Clooney. Most creatures don't even know what Clooney was. He was just some sort of boogeyman that lived in bad dreams in the dark corners of imagination. The silence was broken by scornful snorts and derisive laughter. Furry elbows nudged downy ribs. Mice were beginning to smile from sheer relief. Clooney the Scourge, indeed. Feeling slightly abashed, Matthias and Constant looked pleadingly towards the abbot for support. Abbot Mortimer's old face was as stern as he shook the bell vigorously for silence. Mice of Redwall, I see there are those among you who doubt the word of your abbot. The quiet but authoritative words caused an embarrassing, an embarrassed shuffling from the council elders. Brother Joseph stood up and cleared his throat. <coughs> um, uh, good Father Abbot, we all respect your word and look to you for guidance. But really, I, I mean... Sister Clements stood up smiling. She spread her paws wide. Perhaps Clooney is coming to get us for staying up late? A roar of laughter greeted the ironic words. Constance's back hair bristled. She gave an angry growl, followed by a fierce bark. The mice huddled together with a fright. Nobody had ever seen a snarling, angry badger at a council meeting. Before they could recover, Constance was up on her hind legs having her say, I've never seen such a pack of empty-headed ninnies. You should all be ashamed of yourself, giggling like silly little otter cubs that have caught a beetle. I never thought I'd live to see the elders of Redwall acting in this way. Constance hunched her heavy shoulders and glared about with a ferocity that set them trembling. Now you listen to me. Take heed of what your father abbot has to say. The next creature who utters one squeak will answer to me. Understand? The badger bowed low in a dignified manner, gesturing with her massive blunt paw. The floor is yours, Father Abbot. Thank you, Constance, my good and faithful friend. The abbot murmured. He looked about him, shaking his head gravely. I have little more to say on the subject, but I see that you will need convincing. Here is my proposal. We will send two mice out to relieve the gatehouse. Let me see. Yes, brothers Rufus and George, would you kindly go and take over from brother Methuselah? Please send him in here to me. Tell me, tell him to bring the traveler's record volumes. Not the present issue, but the old editions, 
which were used in past years. Rufus and George, both solid-looking, sensible mice, took their leave with a formal bow to the abbot. Through a high-slitted window, Matthias could see the rosy pink and gold fingers of Dawn stilling down to Cavern Hall as the candles began to flicker and smoke into stubs. All in the space of a night, events had moved from festivity to a crisis, and he, Matthias, had taken a major role in both. First, the big grayling. If you don't remember from uh, the first chapters, the big grayling was the fish that Matthias had caught for the feast. Then the sighting of the cart, large happenings for a small mouse. Old Brother Methuselah had kept the Abbey records for as long as any creature could remember. It was his life's work and consuming passion. Beside the official chronicle of Redwall, he also kept his own personal volume, full of valuable information. Traveling creatures, migratory birds, wandering foxes, rambling squirrels, <laughs> and garrulous hares. They all stopped and chatted with the old mouse, partaking of his hospitality, never dreaming of hurting him in any way. Methuselah had the gift of tongues. He could understand any creature, even a bird. He was an extraordinary old mouse who lived with the company of his volumes in the solitude of the gatehouse. Seated in the Father Abbot's own chair, Methuselah took his spectacles from a moss bark case, carefully perching them on the bridge of his old nose. All gathered round to hear as he opened a, re a record book and spoke in a squeak barely above a whisper. Hmm. Hmm. My lord, Abbot Cedric. It is Cedric, isn't it? Oh, botheration. You'll be the new abbot, Mortimer. The one who came after Cedric. Oh, dear me. I see so many of them come and go. You know... Hmm. Hmm. Me Lord Abbot Mortimer and members of Redwall, I refer to a record of winter six years back. Here the ancient mouse took a while to leaf through the pages. Hmm... Ah, yes, here it is. Late in November, year of the small sweet chestnut, from a frozen sparrowhawk, come down from the far north. Mm. Peculiar chap, spoke with a strange accent. I repaired his right wing, pinfeather. Mm. News of a mine disaster? caused by a large, savage sea rat with an extraordinary tail. It seems that this rat, Clooney they called him, wanted to settle his army in the mine. The badgers and any other creature who owned the mine drove them out. Clooney returned by night and with his band of rats gnawed and undermined much of the wood shoring. This caused the mine to collapse the next day, killing the owners. Brother Methuselah closed the volume and looked over his glasses at the assembly. I have no need to read further. I can recite other misdeeds from memory. As the hordes of Clooney the Scourge have moved southwards over the past six years. I've gathered intelligence of other incidents. A farmhouse set alight. Later that same year, piglets, an entire litter of piglets, eaten alive by rats. 
sickness and disease spread through livestock herds by Clooney's army. There was even a report brought to me two years ago by a town dog. An army of rats stampeded a herd of cows through a village, causing chaos and much destruction. Methuselah halted and blinked over his spectacles. And you dare doubt the word of our abbot? The Clooney the Scourge exist? What idiotic mice you are, to be sure. Methuselah's words caused widespread consternation. There was much added agitated nibbling of paws. Nobody could doubt he spoke the truth. He was already old and wise when the most elderly among them was a blind hairless mite pulling and whimpering for a feed from its mother. Oh, my whiskers! What a mess! Hadn't we better pack up and move? Maybe Clooney will spare us Oh dear, oh dear, what shall we do? Matthias sprang to the middle of the floor, brandishing his staff in a way that surprised even them. Do, he cried. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll be ready. The abbot could not help shaking his head in admiration. It seemed that young Matthias had hidden depths. Well, thank you, Matthias, he said. I could not have put it better myself. That's exactly what we will do. We'll be ready. <laughs> How's everybody doing? This now brings us to chapter 8. Let me know if you would like for me to keep going. <laughs> If everybody is following along, enjoying so far. And let me know how the audio is. I'm trying to differentiate some of the voices for you. Get us a, a sip of coffee here. All right. I tell you what. Give me, give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. Let me top off my coffee. I need to wet my whistle just a little bit. And we'll, what you want? we'll do chapter eight, and then I'll top off my coffee. Here we go. Chapter eight. Clooney the Scourge was having nightmares. He had laid down in the church mouse's bed for a well-earned rest while his army was going about its allotted tasks. He should never have tried to sleep on an empty stomach, but weariness overcame his hunger. In Clooney's dream, everything was shrouded in a red mist. The cries, Aah! The cries of his victims rang out as barns blazed and ships floundered on a stormy red sea. Cattle bellowed in pain as he battled with the pike that had taken his eye. The warlord thrashed about, killing, conquering, and laying waste to all in his dream. Then the phantom figure appeared. At first it seemed a small thing, a mouse in fact, dressed in a long hooded robe. Clooney did not relish meeting with it. He could not tell why. But the mouse kept getting closer to him. For the first time in his life, he turned and ran. Clooney went like a bat out of hell. Glancing back, he saw all the carnage, death, and misery he had caused in his career. The big rat laughed insanely. 
<laughs> the big rat laughed insanely and ran faster, on and on, past scenes of desolation and destruction wreaked by him, Clooney the Scourge. Floating through the red mist, he could still see the strange mouse hard on his heels. Clooney felt himself filled with hatred for his pursuer. It seemed to have grown larger. Its eyes were cold and grim. Deep inside, Clooney knew that even he could not frighten this oddly garbed mouse. Now it was wielding a large bright sword, an ancient weapon of terrible beauty. The battle-scored blade had a word written upon it that he could not make out. Sweat dripped from Clooney's claws like stinging acid. He stumbled. The strange figure was closer. It had grown into a giant. Clooney's lungs felt as if they were bursting. He realized that he had slowed up and the mouse was getting closer. He tried to put on an extra burst of speed, but his legs would not obey. They ran more and more slowly, more and more heavily. Clooney cursed aloud at his leaden limbs. He saw he was trapped in a deep icy mud. For the first time, he knew the meaning of mindless fear and panic. He turned slowly. Too late! The enemy was upon him. He was rooted helpless to the spot. The avenging mouse swung the sword up high. A million lights flashed from its deadly blade as it struck. Bum! The loud toll of the distant Joseph Bell brought Clooney whirling back from the realms of nightmare to cold reality. He shivered, wiping the sweat from his fur with a shaky claw. Saved by the bell. He was puzzled. What did the fearful dream mean? Clooney had never been one to put his faith in omens, but this dream, it had been so lifelike and vivid that he shuddered. A timid Paul, tapping on the door, snapped Clooney from his revier with a start. It was Ragier and Mangefur, his scavengers, they slunk into the room, each trying to hide behind the other, knowing that the poor results of their search were likely to incur the chief's wrath. Their assumption was correct. Clooney's baleful eye watched them as his long, flexible tail sorted through their paltry offerings, which had dropped from their claws. A few dead beetles, two large earthworms, some unidentified vegetation, and the pitiful carcass of a long-dead sparrow. Clooney smiled at rage ear and mange fear. Whew. With a sigh of relief, they grinned back at him. The chief was in a good mood. At lightning speed, the big, air, the big rat's claws shot out and grabbed them both cruelly by the ears. The stupid hench rats yowled piteously <coughs> as they were lifted bodily from the floor and swung to and fro. In a fit of rage, <coughs> Clooney bashed their heads together. Half senseless, they were hurled towards the doorway with his angry words ringing in their skulls. Beetles, worms, rotten sparrows, 
get me meat, tender young red meat. Next time you bring me rubbish like this, I'll spit the pair of you and have you roasted in your own juice. Is that clear? Mangefur posted an accusing claw at his companion. Please, chief, it was Rager's fault. If we'd gone across the fields instead of up the road. Don't believe that big fat liar, chief. It was him who suggested going up the road. Not me. Get out. The scavengers dashed off, bumping clumsily into each other with panic as they tried to get through the door together. Clooney slumped back on the bed and ha, snorted impatiently. Frog blood and scum nose were next to report. They bore news that cheered Clooney up somewhat. They'd obtained over a hundred new recruits, mainly rats, but with a good scattering of ferrets and weasels and the odd stoat. There had been some who needed convincing. These had been press-ganged by a savage beating from flog, frog blood, coupled with the threat of horrible death. They were soon convinced that the wisest course was to enlist in Clooney's horde. Others were hungry nomads, only too willing to join up with the infamous Clooney. They were greedy for plunder and booty and pleased to be on what they sure what they were sure would be the winning side. Lined up in the churchyard, the recruits were supplied with weaponry by Red Tooth and Dark Claw. Impassively, they stood in ranks awaiting the warlord's inspection. Clooney nodded his approval. Scurvy rats, hungry ferrets, sly weasels, bad stoats, Exactly what he needed. Read him the articles, Red Tooth, he snapped. Red Tooth swaggered back and forth on the churchyard, paving as he recited the formula from memory. Right! Eyes front! You're in the service of Clooney the Scourge now, me buckos! Desert, and you'll be killed! Retreat, and you're under sentence of death. Disobey, and you'll die. I'm Red Tooth, Clooney's number one rat. You will obey the word of your captains. They take orders from me. I take orders from Clooney. Remember that. Now, if any one, two, or a group or even all of you together want to try and beat Clooney and lead the horde, this is your chance. Without warning, Clooney charged headlong into the new recruits, lashing out widely with his scourging tail. He bowled them left, right, and center with his massive strength. Baring his teeth and sl slitting his eye, he weeped fiercely away until they fell back and scattered in disorder, hiding behind gravestones. Clooney threw back his head and roared with laughter. Ha 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 ha! No guts, eh? Ha! It's just as well. I don't want deadens on my claws before I find a proper battle for you to fight. And make no mistake, when the right time comes, I'll see you fight. Aye, and die too. Now raise your weapons, and let's see if you know who your master is. A motley collection of evil-looking implements was framed by the cloudless sky as wild cries rang out from the newly inducted recruits. Clooney! Clooney! Clooney the Scourge! <laughs> that is chapter eight. Give me, give me two minutes to, to top off my coffee and we will go to chapter seven. 
Let me put this up on the screen. <laughs> How's everybody doing so far, by the way? Let's see. And we'll make this. We just I just need a five five minutes to get my coffee. And so you can go you can go get yourself something to drink and then we will pick up on chapter nine if you are uh, if you are following along at home. Alright. Put that right there just so everybody knows. <laughs> and I will be right back. I will be right back. Alright, in just a moment here we're gonna pick up with the next with the next chapter. I guess I can turn the little, little break thing off. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> I like this story. I haven't I haven't read it in man. Maybe over twenty years. Quite a bit of quite a bit of violence in it for a children's story. I don't think it's a, a young children's story. <laughs> definitely, definitely clearly, clear good and evil, though. And how is everyone doing? Let me know. Let me know when everybody's back and we'll get going here again. Hopefully everybody is, is comfy. Let me know when everyone is back, and I will restart. I should have. If I had been smarter, I would have would have started the stream with a full cup of coffee, something to wet the whistle. All right, and again, if you are if you're reading along at home, we've read chapter six, seven, and eight, and now we are going into chapter nine of Redwall by Brian Jakes. All right, there we go. So back at Redwall Abbey, chapter nine. Abbot Mortimer and Constance the Badger meandered through the grounds together. Both creatures were deep in thought. Had they spoken and voiced their thoughts, they would have mentioned the same subject, the safety of Redwall. Down long ages, the beautiful old ha abbey had stood for happiness, peace, and refuge to all. Diligent mice tended the neat little vegetable patches, which every season gave forth an abundance of fresh produce. Cabbages, sprouts, marrows, turnips, peas, carrots, tomatoes, lettuces, and onions, all in their turn. Flower beds, heady and fragrant, 
with countless varieties of summer blooms, from rose to humble daisy, were planted by the mice and husbanded by the hard-working bee folk who in their turn rewarded Redwall with plentiful supplies of honey and beeswax. The two friends wandered onward, past the pond. Early morning sunlight glinted off the water, throwing out ripples from the, fr from the fish caught by the overnight lines, which were baited and left to drift each e evening by Brother Elf. Ahead of them lay the berry hedges, raspberry, blackberry, bilberry, and the strawberry patch, where every August sleepy baby creatures could be seen, their stomachs full after eating the pick of the crop. Gradually they made their way around the big old chestnut trees into the orchard. This was the abbot's favorite spot, many a leisurely nap had he taken on sunny afternoons, with the aroma of ripening fruit hovering in his whiskers. Apples, pears, quince, plums, damsons, even a vine of old grape on the warm red stone of a south-facing wall. Old Mother Nature's blessing lay upon a haven of warm friendliness. Now, with the threat of Clooney upon Redwall, the two old friends assessed the beauteous bounty of their lifelong abode. Sweet birdsong on the steel air tinged Constance's heart with sorrow and regret that this peaceful existence would soon pass. <sighs> Gruffly, she snuffled deep in her throat blinking off a threatening teardrop. The abbot sensed his companion's distress. He patted the badger's rough coat with a gentle paw. There, there, old girl, don't fret. Many times in our history has tragedy been forestalled by miraculous happenings. Hmm. Constance grunted in agreement, not wishing to disillusion her trusting old friend. Deep within her, she knew a dark shadow was casting itself over the abbey. Furthermore, it was happening in the present, not in the bygone days of fabled deeds. Matthias seated himself to an early breakfast in Cavern Hall. Nut bread, apples, and a bowl of fresh goat's milk. Corn flour. Now, if, if you don't remember or if you're just getting caught up, corn flour is a pretty young mouse, and Matthias seems to be a little bit infatuated with her. Corn flour, along with other woodland creatures, granted sanctuary was sleeping in makeshift quarters provided by the good mice of Redwall. Matthias felt he had grown up overnight. Duty was a mantle that he had taken willingly upon his shoulders. If there was a threat to Redwall from outside, it must be dealt with. The mice of Redwall were peaceful creatures but that must not be taken as a sign of weakness. Stolidly, he munched away as he confronted the problem. Eat heartily, Matthias. No point in facing trouble on an empty stomach. Feed the body, nourish the mind. The young mouse was surprised to see that old brother Methuselah had been watching him his eyes twinkling behind the curious spectacles he invariably wore. The ancient mouse sat down at the breakfast table with a small groan. Hmm. Don't look so surprised, young one. Your face is an open book 
to one of my ears. Matthias drained the last of the milk from his bowl, wiping cream from his whiskers with the back of a paw. Give me your advice, Brother Methuselah, he said. What would you do? The old mouse wrinkled his nose. Exactly the same thing as you would. That is, if I were younger and not so old and stiff. Matthias felt that he had found an ally. You mean you would fight? Methuselah wrapped the table with a bony paw. Of course I would. It's the only sensible course to take. He paused and stared at Matthias in an odd manner. Hmm. You know there's something about you, young feller. Did you ever hear the story of how Martin the warrior first came to Redwall? Matthias leaned together eagerly. Martin? Tell me, brother. I love hearing about the warrior monk. Methuselah's voice dropped to a secretive whisper. It is written in the great chronicle of Redwall that Martin was very young to be such a warrior. He could have been the same age as yourself, Matthias. Like you, he was impulsive and had a great quality of youthful innocence about him when he first came to our abbey. But it is also written that in time of trouble, Martin had the gift of a natural leader, a command over others far superior to him in age and experience. The Chronicle says they look to Martin as some look to a strong father. Matthias was full of wonderment, but he could not help feeling puzzled. Why do you tell all this to me, Brother Methuselah? The old mouse stood up. He stared hard at Matthias for a moment. Then turning, he shuffled slowly off. As he went, he called back over his shoulder. Because, Matthias, because he was very like you. Before the young mouse could question the old one further, the Joseph Bell tolled out a warning. Sandals slapping. Sandals slapping. Matthias dashed out into the grounds, nearly colliding with the abbot and Constance, who, like everyone else, were heading for the gatehouse. Brother Rufus and George had an incident to report. A large, evil-looking rat, covered in tattoos and carrying a rusty cutlass, had turned up at the gate. He had tried to gain entry by pretending he was injured. Limping about, the rat explained that he had been in a hay cart that overturned into a ditch. Would they come with him and render assistance to his friends, many of whom were lying trapped beneath the cart, crying out for help? Brother Rufus was no fool, how many rats were traveling in the cart altogether, he asked. Oh, a couple of hundred, came the glib reply. Then why, reasoned Brother Rufus, did the rats not give aid to their own companions? Surely all two hundred were not trapped. The rat evaded the question and made a great show of rubbing his injured leg. Could they not take him in and dress his wound, and perhaps give him a bite to eat at least? 
Brother George agreed on condition that the rat surrender his weapon. The rat made as if to do so, then suddenly lunged at Brother George, only to be sent sprawling by a blow from Brother Rufus's staff. Realizing that he was up against two big competent mice who would stand no nonsense, he became abusive and bad-mouthed. Ha! Just you wait, mice, he raged. There's a whole army of us camped down in the church. When I tell Clooney how you treated me, ho, 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 just wait. That's all. We'll be back. By fang we will. With that, he slunk off, cursing all, my, all mice. The grim news was digested in silence by the assembled creatures. Mrs. Churchmouth began sobbing. Oh, oh, dearie me, did you hear that, my dear? They must be living in our home at St. Ninian's Church. Oh, oh, f whatever shall we do? Our dear little home, full of dreadful rats. Mr. John Churchmouth tried to comfort his wife as best as he could. There, there, hush now, missus. Better to lose a house than lose our lives. A good job we got sanctuary here at Redwall. But what about the other creatures in the area? cried Matthias. Sensible mouth, sensible mouse, said Constance. Is Ambrose Spike anywhere about? I think Ambrose Spike is either the hedgehog or the porcupine. <laughs> sensible mouth, said mouse, said Constance. Is Ambrose Spike anywhere about? He'd better do the rounds and tell them to sink sanctuary here at the Abbey as quickly as possible. Spike will come to no harm. Once he curls up, there's nothing that can touch him. This idea was greeted with enthusiasm. Brother Alf went out to find the hedgehog. The abbot suggested they all go inside the Abbey and await further developments. Matthias piped up again. We best mount a guard on the walls. One of the older mice, Sister Clements, chided Matthias as an upstart. Her voice was stern and condescending. Novice Matthias, you will be silent and do as your abbot commands. Much to everyone's surprise, the abbot came to Matthias's defense. One moment, Clements. Matthias speaks sense. Let us hear what he has to say. We are none of us too old to learn. All eyes were turned on the young mouth. All eyes were turned on the young mouse as Matthias heard himself boldly outline his plans for the defense of Redwall. It was 11 o'clock on that glorious June morning. Mossflower Wood and the Meadowland stirred to the brazen voice of the great Joseph Bell. John Churchmouth heaved on the bell rope as he has been told to by Constance and Matthias. Bong! Boom! Bong! Boom! Even the small creatures in wood and field who could understand no language save their own knew what it meant. Time of danger, place of sanctuary. Carrying what simple belongings they needed, woodlanders and their families hurried from far and near to gain the safety of the abbey before the storm of Clooney broke upon them. Squirrels, mice, voles, moles, otters, all save the birds of the air who were safe anyway. Up the long dusty road they came, 
mothers protectively hurting young ones, while fathers provided a rear guard. Brother Methuselah stood at the gate with the abbot. He translated fully to each group of the creatures the abbot's message, in turn, construing back to the father abbot their grateful thanks with pledges of help and loyalty to Redwall Abbey. For what creature had not been, friend, had not been freely given the aid and special knowledge of the kindly mice? All knew that they owed their very existence to the abbot and his community. Healing, aid, food, shelter, and good advice were granted to all. Now was the time to unite and to repay, to give any help that was possible. Before much longer, Redwall would require the skills and knowledge of all its woodland allies they would be gratefully given. <clears throat> Matthias and Constance stood on top of the high perimeter walls watching the road. It was noon and the sun shone directly overhead. Despite the heat, Matthias had ordered all the mice to put on their hoods. It served a double purpose, to shield their eyes from the sun and create a camouflage effect. Silently, each one stood, armed with a stout staff. The high red sandstone walls were far too lofty to be scaled by any normal creature. Instinctively, Matthias knew that this was a good defense and a formidable deterrent. Constance could feel her hackles beginning to prickle. She sniffed the air and shivered, despite the heat that shimmered in waves across the, the meadowlands. The big badger nudged Matthias. Listen to that. Matthias pricked up his ears and looked at her, questioning. Even the birds have stopped singing, Constance said quietly. The young mouse gripped his staff tighter. Yes, it's the silence we can hear. The grasshoppers have gone quiet. Constance peered down the road as she spoke. Strange for a summer day, little friend. Bong! Every creature standing on the ramparts twitched with fright as the loud voice of the Joseph Bell rang out and John Churchmouse, John Churchmouse shouted from his position high in the belfry, They're coming! Down the road! I can see them! I can see them! <laughs> that is the end of chapter 9. I think next time, next time, we've been going for about an hour here, next time we will pick up with chapter 10. Chapter 10. And again, if, if you want to re read along with this, I put a link to the Amazon site. And that's, uh, that's not an affiliate link. I, I'm not making anything off this. Uh, I, I've set the money, or I've set the video to demonetized because I don't, I don't own the rights to this. But I just wanted to do a, a story time again, something, something fun, something accessible. I think this book is is pretty safe for probably all but the very youngest children. They might be a little bit scared by some of that. There is, there is some mouse and mouse violence. <laughs> Oh, uh, tomorrow, let's see, tomorrow is Friday. Uh, I may not do a stream on Friday. We'll see how that goes. If I don't do one on Friday, I will probably pick this back up uh, Saturday. And then Saturday, since I have a little bit longer, maybe I will try and go for about two hours. But we'll, we'll start back up on chapter, on chapter 10 when we pick up. Anyway. 
Thank you for all for hanging out with me. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying this story as much as I am. Again, this is Redwall by Brian Jakes. Anyway, until, until we meet each other again, I wish you a good night. Aloha. And God bless you all. Good night.